Hello, my name is uh, Ariel Mikolas. I am from uh, Cluj-Napoca. Uh, I have a master's degree in cybersecurity and I also uh, am a teaching assistant for x86 assembly language programming. Um, I'm a software engineer at Cisco and um, today I will talk about uh, uh, PuzzleFS, the next generation uh, container file system. So let's get started. Uh, first I will uh, present a short introduction, then um, I will uh, talk about uh, the OCI drawbacks. So this, this will be the problem statement. Moving on to design goals, uh, status and a quick demo. Uh, then uh, the PuzzleFS data format, uh, the results. Uh, the Linux kernel file system that I've implemented uh, and uh, at the end I will be happy to answer uh, your questions. Uh, so, uh, for some context, uh, context uh, PuzzleFS was uh, started by Tank, uh, Tycho Anderson in 2021. He had a FOSDEM presentation in 2019. Uh, about AtomFS, uh, my colleague Scott Moser also presented uh, AtomFS earlier uh, uh, this year. Uh, so the idea with uh, AtomFS uh, was uh, to replace the uh, tar layers of the uh, OCI image with uh, SquashFS layers uh, and also add uh, the, unver the unverity data for uh, integrity. Um, this has the advantage that uh, you, can, you can directly mount the SquashFS layers and uh, uh, also uh, verify the integrity. Uh, what, is, what is DM Verity? In short, it, uh, it is uh, an in integrity protection at uh, the block device layer. Uh, and uh, if someone wants to tamper with uh, any of the blocks, uh, instead of returning the tamper data, the uh, Linux kernel will just uh, return an error. Uh, and you, you also cannot, uh, you cannot r write to uh, those uh, blocks. Um, why I'm mentioning uh, AtomFS? Uh, this is because PuzzleFS aims to be uh, its uh, successor. And it is part of the larger project machine that we are uh, working on at Cisco. Uh, this is, of course, also open source, and uh, uh, this is an OCI-based secure uh, container Linux. Um, for some uh, OCI format basics, um, OCI comes from o Open Container Initiative. It is uh, a standardization of uh, the original Docker format. Uh, and this is the directory layout. It all starts from uh, index.json. Uh, where um, uh, you, you will usually uh, find a tag. For example, if you want the latest uh, Ubuntu image, then the latest uh, is, uh, is actually the name of the tag. So you, using this tag, uh, you will uh, get a, a pointer to a manifest, and from the manifest, uh, you will have pointers to uh, the uh, image configuration, which uh, stores uh, stuff like uh, environment variables, uh, and also you will have uh, multiple uh, pointers to uh, the layers. These, uh, 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 these layers actually contain the, um, the bits of the image, so the, the data, the actual data on disk. Uh, these layers are uh, usually tar layers, uh, but uh, they, are, uh, they are also compressed, so it, it will be a tar.gz uh, file. And um, if, you can, uh, if you look at the file names, these, uh, these are uh, uh, hashes. This is because uh, they, they, are, they are stored content addressed. So, so they, their SHA-256 uh, checksum is also their name uh, on the file system. And uh, when, I, uh, when you hear me talk about the data store, I'm, what I'm actually re referring to is this uh, uh, blob SHA-256 directory where uh, all the uh, data blobs reside. 
Um, so all the problems uh, stem from, uh, uh, from this uh, TOR file representation in uh, uh, the first version of OCI. Uh, there's a really detailed blog post uh, written by Alex Asara in 2019 where he describes all the issue uh, with this format. And I, I will uh, try to uh, present a few of them. Uh, yes, as, you, as I've mentioned, the layers are usually in the tar.gz format. So first of all, tar is not a well-defined format. It's not a standard. It is rather a collection of different formats, and each have their own extensions. Uh, it has no index. Archive entries just simply consist of header, dot, uh, uh, header plus uh, content. So uh, files are actually concatenated together, and this is the, uh, basically, basically the uh, tar archive format. And you can imagine if you have a very large uh, archive, uh, it will take some time to seek and find uh, the file that you are looking for. Another problem is that uh, compression and encryption cannot happen underneath the TOR archive. So you cannot store compressed files in the, inside the archive. You need to apply compression on top of the archive. And um, if you imagine the same large file, you have to decompress everything before you can, uh, you can uh, then search again uh, for the files that you uh, are looking for. So, um, another disadvantage is that there, there is uh, no duplication. Any change you make in the tar file uh, will, uh, will lead to an entire, entirely different uh, checksum, uh, SHA-256 SHA uh, hash. Uh, so this means that uh, if you want to download another version of the same image, you have to download uh, uh, the entire tar archive you cannot uh, download uh, just the parts uh, just the parts that have changed between the images uh, but there is one small mention here if you have multiple images which share the same layer then uh, there you will get some inter layer sharing uh, this is fragile because as i mentioned any small change will lead to uh, an entirely different layer there is no true machine independent representation. Uh, this is because uh, the directory entries and the extended attributes can be presented by the uh, file system in different orders. And uh, you can have uh, the files in a TOR archive in any order uh, that you like. It's, uh, it's the same file system that is represented, but there is uh, there is no canonical representation. You cannot say, uh, this, is, this is from this file system, this is how I want my TAR archive to look like. And this, uh, this leads to this lack of reprodu reproducibility problem. You cannot, uh, you cannot reproduce uh, uh, the uh, TAR archives. And on top of this, uh, the extensions, uh, the multiple uh, extensions add to this problem. For example, there are five different extensions for specifi specifying uh, extended attributes. So our design goals for uh, PuzzleFS uh, are basically to solve the most pertinent uh, OCI v1 problems. Uh, we would like to have reduced duplication, reproducible image build, direct mounting support, data integrity, uh, and also memory safety guarantees, uh, and ideally the same implementation in user space and uh, kernel. Uh, so how do we achieve reduced application? Uh, well, we can use content-defined chunking. This uh, solves the boundary shift problem that I will uh, uh, talk about in the next uh, slide. Uh, we use the, the fast CDC algorithm uh, to, funk, to chunk an entire file system into uh, variable sized uh, chunks. And with fast CDC, you can specify a minimum, average, and maximum uh, chunk size that you uh, uh, so basically arrange uh, for the sizes of uh, your chunks. Okay, uh, so this is, this is the boundary shift problem. 
Uh, on the top, you can see we have uh, file A, uh, and uh, the file A prime uh, is uh, almost the same as file A, but we have uh, inserted uh, one byte at the beginning, this FF byte. So with the traditional uh, FSC approach, this stands for uh, fixed size chunking, where you just uh, split a file into equally sized uh, blocks. Uh, in this case, uh, adding, inserting uh, a byte uh, at the beginning of the file has an unwanted avalanche effect. So every byte shifts to the right, and then you will have no duplicates detected. Uh, on the contrary, if we, if you look, we look at the uh, content-defined chunking approach, uh, doing the same operation, uh, we will get most of the uh, duplicates detected. Um, the first chunk will be changed because we have inserted an FF byte, but uh, all the um, uh, all the other uh, chunks will stay the same. Uh, you can see here that every time we find a nine uh, in this uh, um, file, we declare a cut point. Uh, of, of course, uh, the algorithm is uh, more complicated than this, but I, I will show it uh, later. So, uh, for uh, uh, real-world application. Imagine we have uh, uh, Ubuntu image at version N, which has 80 megabytes in size, and uh, we want to apply a small patch to libssl.so. Maybe uh, this is a security patch. And now we get uh, uh, another version of Ubuntu, uh, which is at uh, version N plus uh, one. It's uh, still almost, it's still around 80 megabytes in size. Uh, but the delta size, the size we have to ship uh, to the end user, uh, it will also be 80 megabytes because we need an entire, uh, in, an entirely new uh, tar layer. So the the solution here here is to uh, use uh, uh, CDC, content defined chunking. Uh, if we do, uh, if we chunk the entire file system into chunks, and then we uh, uh, only do a small patch to libssl.so, uh, only one chunk will be changed in this uh, entire uh, list of chunks, and then uh, uh, the Ubuntu image at n plus one will still be around 80 megabytes in size, uh, but uh, the size that we need to ship this small patch is around. 80 kilobytes. This is based on the average chunk size that uh, PuzzleFS uh, uses. Uh, so for, uh, uh, for getting, getting into the details of content-defined chunking, uh, so uh, this uses the sliding window technique and uh, it's, uh, it computes the hash of the, the window. This is called uh, a rolling hash. And then we take the last n bits of the hash, uh, and if are zero, uh, if these are zero, we gener generate a cut point. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about this uh, is that the cut points only depend on the last uh, window size bytes, uh, which uh, is usually 48 bytes. So we start uh, from the window. We start with this window. Uh, we compute the hash. Uh, if the hash uh, uh, has the last uh, n bits zero, then we say we found a, uh, uh, a cut point. Uh, if not, then uh, we just uh, move the window uh, one position to the right and uh, repeat the same process. Um, so you can imagine uh, if you insert uh, multiple bytes uh, in the beginning or in the middle, then you still have uh, some. Uh, you still have a pretty good chance. Uh, of uh, identifying the same uh, um, cut points. Uh, uh, our next goal is um, to have a reproduci reproducible image builds. We want to have a canonical representation of the file system. So for this, we, uh, uh, we define uh, the same traversal order of the file system. So for example, uh, you can uh, you can traverse the file system in breadth, for, breadth first uh, or depth, depth first. We want to make sure it's the same order uh, when we are building a puzzle FS image. Then 
Uh, we make sure the directory entries and the extended attributes are sorted uh, lexicographically. And finally, as an implementation detail, we use B3 maps uh, because they have a defined order, uh, unlike uh, uh, regular hash maps. Another, uh, another, uh, another goal we have is uh, to prevent tampering. So for this, we would like uh, direct mounting support. So one other issue uh, with uh, the TAR archive is uh, uh, that uh, you need to extract it first before uh, making use of it. So uh, this uh, leads to a problem because then you cannot make sure uh, that the data was not changed in the meantime. You cannot, you cannot uh, uh, put, it, uh, put your extracted um, uh, data back into a, a TAR archive and then compare the two. Uh, and say, okay, nobody uh, tampered with the data. Uh, so uh, what we want is uh, to remove this extraction step and uh, uh, mount the file system uh, directly so uh, then we can make sure uh, we, are, uh, we are using the same thing that we've uh, originally built. And also we want uh, the format to be simple enough so we can decode it uh, in the kernel. Um, speaking of data integrity, um, if you remember, I've mentioned the AtomFS at the beginning of the talk, and uh, uh, AtomFS was using the Unverity, but this doesn't fit our use case. This is because even if uh, PuzzleFS is a read-only file system, uh, we still want to write uh, to the data store. If, you, uh, if we want to download a new image, uh, uh, a new PuzzleFS image, then we need to write, uh, write the new blobs to the data store. So it doesn't fit uh, our use case. But we have uh, optional support for um, FS Verity. FS Verity uh, is very similar to DM Verity, but instead of working on uh, block devices, it works uh, on individual files. Uh, and uh, it must be supported by the, under, uh, by the underlying file system uh, on which uh, PuzzleFS resides. What we do if, uh, is we compute FS Verity digest for each file, and we store it in the PuzzleFS image manifest. And uh, then uh, the uh, PuzzleFS image manifest uh, itself, we also need to uh, compute the FS Verity hash and uh, uh, pass that information in an out-of-bound uh, way. Uh, so we do this by uh, passing it on the command line of uh, PuzzleFS mount. Um, for uh, PuzzleFS, we want memory safety guarantees, and um, uh, so this uh, uh, led to the decision of implementing it in Rust. Uh, both the Fuse uh, uh, version and the in-kernel in file system. Uh, it, it has, Rust has man, many benefits. It uh, entirely eliminates undefined behavior and uh, entire classes of bugs. Uh, for example, dangling pointers, use after free uh, buffer overflows. It has a very strong type system uh, and a first class support for writing unit and integration tests. So it makes it very easy for you to uh, actually write uh, the tests. And uh, for all of this reason, um, in my personal experience, it, is a very, uh, it leads to a very painless iterative development. Uh, and uh, finally, we want to share uh, uh, the code both in user and kernel space. <coughs> Luckily, Rust support for uh, the kernel was merged in Linux 6.1. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to write the same code twice. But of course, there are some differences. First of all, uh, the kernel only allows uh, fallible allocations. So everything that you allocate, you must uh, be able to deal with the fact that this allocation might fail. It's not uh, like in user space where you don't care and then uh, the out-of-memory uh, uh, out uh, killer uh, jumps in and uh, kills, uh, uh, kills your process. 
And also, we cannot handle the file operations in the same way. You can imagine the uh, user space API is quite different fr uh, from the uh, kernel uh, abstraction of uh, files. Uh, and uh, we also must duplicate the code for practi practical purposes because the kernel has its own build system. You cannot just download the crate from crates.io. Or for the, that matter, you cannot even use the cargo build system. You need, you need to use the uh, K-build. Um, but uh, apart from these uh, small differences, uh, a, large, uh, a large amount of code uh, uh, I, was I was able to uh, share between uh, uh, the two implementations. Uh, moving on to the status of the project, we, uh, we can build, extract, and fuse mount puzzle FSA file systems. Uh, we have support for FS Verity, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, it requires uh, file system support from the underlying uh, data store. Uh, and uh, we also have an optional ZSTD compression for the data blobs. Um, what, I, what I've done in the uh, past months, I've also implemented a, a proof of concept uh, file system driver uh, written in Rust. Uh, so for a quick demo, uh, you can see here at the, the top, uh, I have a, a root file system which uh, contains two directories and, uh, uh, no, sorry, one directory and two files. Uh, if we want to build a PuzzleFS image, we specify the uh, build command uh, and we pass the source uh, of uh, our root file system, uh, then the destination where the PuzzleFS uh, puzzle image will be stored, and then uh, uh, we also need to specify a tag for this image. What we get uh, uh, back from this uh, build command is the uh, FS Verity Digest of the puzzle FS uh, image. And we will use this to, uh, uh, we will have to use this in uh, our uh, subsequent uh, commands. Uh, the next step is optional. If we want, uh, we can enable uh, FS Verity. We need to specify uh, the uh, path to the puzzle FS image, the tag, and also this uh, hash that I was talking about. If we enable FS Verity, it actually sends some uh, ioctals to the kernel, and then um, uh, the, uh, the files in the data store uh, will be marked read-only, so you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot write to them. And also, if tampering was detected, the kernel will just return uh, an, error, uh, an error code instead of giving you the tampered data. Uh, and uh, lastly, we use the mount command, where you, uh, here we can uh, also optionally specify this, uh, this FS Verity Digest. Uh, and then we use the, we have the puzzle FS, uh, the path to the puzzle FS image, the tag, and uh, also a mount point. And if all goes, goes well, you can see uh, the output uh, in a journal where it says mounting slash temp slash. Uh, uh, puzzle, and uh, uh, also the output of uh, mount, uh, in the output of mount you will see we have uh, slash temp slash puzzle, which is of type fuse. If we do specify this digest on the uh, command line uh, of mount, then uh, puzzlefs will make sure uh, before opening any of the files in the data store, it will make sure first that the FS Verity in is enabled for those files, uh, and uh, secondly, that the FS Verity measurement matches uh, what it has in uh, its uh, database. Uh, now, um, uh, let's move on to the PuzzleFS data format. Uh, we uh, have an index.json file. Uh, and uh, with the help of a tag, we can find the manifest uh, for uh, uh, this tag. Uh, the manifest contains a list of metadata layers, and these layers contain a list of inodes. Uh, uh, and here I wanted to show the different ways in which the data blobs could be produced by the chunking algorithm. 
Uh, on the left, you see that uh, inode 1 and inode 2, there are two files, uh, but their uh, contents is stored in a single uh, uh, large data blob. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, uh, for inode 2, um, you can see that it has uh, um, a, list, uh, a list of chunks that it points to. So uh, probably it's a larger file and uh, it, uh, it needs uh, uh, more uh, chunks uh, to represent the, uh, the entire data uh, for this file. Uh, and here you can see that uh, these are hashes uh, because uh, uh, these uh, data blobs are content uh, addressed. So, uh, what we do for metadata serialization is uh, we use uh, Captain Proto. This is the serialization protocol. Uh, it has uh, many advantages. Basically, the on-disk format is the same as the in-memory format, so you can just mem memory map the entire file, and then you will, uh, you will have to use some accessor methods to get to the fields because it has a custom uh, representation in memory. Uh, and as, uh, as you've seen in the previous slide, we have two levels of indirection. Uh, the image manifest, this contains uh, a list of metadata layers and uh, also the FS Verity data for the blobs. And each, uh, each metadata layer contains, uh, uh, first of all, the metadata for the files and directories, but also those links that you've uh, just seen uh, to the data blobs. And this I have already mentioned, uh, we store them content uh, addressed. Uh, so here is the Captain Proto uh, schema for uh, the metadata for the manifest on the left and the metadata on the right. Um, with the bold, I have highlighted that this is this is the uh, the root structure uh, for this file. So this this is a structure that you you will use when you want to decode the, the Captain Proto file. Uh, and as you see, we, the root file system contains a list of metadata, the FS Verity data, and also uh, the manifest version. And on the right, we have the inode vector, which is just a list, uh, uh, is, it's a list of inodes. So one thing that the Captain Proto gives us is a compact inode representation. So this, this entire file uh, actually re represents uh, only two inodes. Uh, but uh, Captain, uh, Captain Proto um, splits, uh, a, uh, splits a structure into the data part and a pointer part. So if you have nested structures, uh, then the outer structure will, uh, com will be completely self-contained uh, and uh, the, the nested structures will be stored elsewhere and you will have a pointer from the outer structure to the um, nested structure. Here with red, you can see the inode number of uh, the uh, of the inode, um, and uh, with white, I have shown the the pointer part for both these inodes. So, uh, why is this important? Because we want to fit as many inodes in the cache. Uh, and this, this is because we want to have a very fast binary search when we, when we are ser searching for uh, an inode in the file system. Now let's look at um, the results. So what I did uh, was I've downloaded 10 versions of Jemmy from Docker Hub. Um, and, and I've put these versions into separate directories. So separate repository, separate OCI repositories for each of these versions. Then um, uh, what is also important is that the, all these images only have one layer in tar.gz format. So you will not get any interlayer sharing uh, in this case. And then what I've did, I've converted uh, these images to uh, PuzzleFS images. And I've made some uh, calculations, so I wanted to know how, how much the, uh, all these versions uh, take, uh, take up if, uh, uh, they are, uh, if they would be stored as simply, simply as tar files without any compression. And this is the, uh, 
this is the baseline that I will use uh, for uh, uh, comparing the space savings. Uh, then what I did is I've taken uh, uh, all these uh, 10 OCI repositories and I have just summed their sizes. This will give, this will give, give us the total size. Uh, and I did this uh, for both uh, the OCI and the PuzzleFS images. And then uh, what is really important is uh, what is the space savings if all these 10 versions would, would be in a single OCI repository or a single PuzzleFS uh, repository. I call this the unified size because here is where we will get uh, all, the uh, all the sharing, all the data sharing uh, with PuzzleFS. Uh, and then uh, for computing the saved space, I just took the tarball total size, and I have then subtracted total unified uh, size uh, from it. And in, in this table, uh, we can see at the top we have the uh, OCI format, uh, but uh, this is the uncompressed uh, case, which y you will not see very often. Usually, compression is also applied. Uh, so we have a total size of 766 megabytes. If, uh, uh, so this is if you just uh, add the, uh, the, tar the size of the tarballs for each version. Uh, then you have, we have an average layer size of 77 megabytes and the unified size. This will also be 766 megabytes. This is because with TAR you don't, uh, you don't get any sharing. So even if you put them in a single uh, OCI repository, it will still be 10 different uh, uh, TAR balls, each, uh, each with uh, their own unique hash. Uh, then uh, I did the same thing for PuzzleFS uh, uh, in the uncompressed case. We have a similar total size and average layer size, but you can see here uh, that the unified size, it's, uh, it, it is uh, much smaller. It's only 130 megabytes. And the saved space is 83%. Then for the uh, compressed case uh, of uh, OCI, uh, we have a much smaller size, it's only 282 megabytes uh, with an average layer size of 28 megabytes. Uh, and uh, here you see that the unified size is still the, the same as the total size because we just applied compression, we didn't do anything special. Uh, and here the safe space is 63%. Uh, so you can see that even in, in the uncompressed case, PuzzleFS still beats the compressed OCI with uh, around 20% uh, in space savings. And if we uh, apply compression uh, uh, with PuzzleFS, then uh, we will get an even uh, smaller size. Uh, the unified size is only 53 megabytes, and we have 93% uh, space savings. This is 30% more than um, in the OCI case. So let's, now let's move on to the kernel file system driver. Um, we at Cisco want to, uh, want to have uh, PuzzleFS uh, in the upstream kernel. So we, we posted uh, an RFC uh, to the Linux mailing list. Um, and um, this, uh, this driver is written in Rust. Uh, there are actually two versions of this uh, driver. Uh, they, are, they are both based on Wetson uh, Almeida's work. Uh, he had, he had uh, originally a set of file system abstractions, uh, but um, recently uh, he uh, made uh, uh, a set of abstractions only for read-only file systems. But uh, neither of these are, uh, are not yet uh, upstream. Um, so I've, uh, uh, I've implemented uh, these, uh, these versions on top of his abstractions. He's also working on um, uh, tar FS. So this is why he needs this uh, read-only file system abstractions. Uh, but what we, what we need to do is we have to add third-party crates to the Linux uh, kernel, namely Captain Proto Rust, 
This is uh, for the metadata serialization and also hex to deal with uh, the hex strings that appear in the uh, digests. There are some challenges uh, writing uh, file system drivers in Rust. The first of all, first of all, we have many missing Rust abstractions because the infrastructure is immature and uh, it, it is still under development. Um, and uh, if you want to integrate uh, third-party crates, then we require uh, no STD support, first of all. Uh, and we also can only use fallible allocation APIs. So we have to, do, uh, we have to use try new and deal with, uh, uh, potential, uh, with a potential error instead of new, uh, try, push, try push instead of push, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, I've uh, actually been to the Rust uh, for Linux workshop this weekend. It happened in uh, Asturias, and uh, we had interesting uh, discussions there uh, about file systems. So now for, uh, for a quick demo uh, of the file system driver. Uh, we can see here in uh, uh, slash proc slash file systems that we have a, a puzzle FS entry. And uh, if we want to mount it, we have to specify uh, two mount options. So first of all is the OCI root directory. Uh, this is the path to the puzzlefs image. And then we uh, also have to uh, specify the image manifest, which is this uh, long digest. Uh, and uh, we have to do this because uh, we don't want to read JSON files from inside the kernel, so we, we cannot just simply use a tag and then uh, get from the tag uh, uh, to the image manifest. So you can see here that uh, I, have, uh, 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 I have shown uh, where I got this digest from. So it's in this uh, index.json file. And now once, once it is mounted, uh, we can uh, list the directory entries you can see I have four uh, directories and two files, and also we can, uh, we can read the files, we can um, count the number of words in uh, uh, the files, and uh, so on. Uh, and now, finally, uh, for Captain Proto Rust kernel integration, uh, so Captain Proto is uh, an external crate. I wanted to integrate it in the kernel. Uh, so I had to do some work to implement full no alloc support. There was some work, but it, it was not finalized. Um, what they did, they used strings in uh, error codes, and we don't have string support in the kernel, so I had to replace this with uh, enums. Uh, and I also had to implement uh, some um, other uh, uh, structures, uh, because uh, it... Uh, so basically, it was easier to, uh, to implement full no alloc support than to try to um, replace the infallible allocation API with a fallible allocation API. So I introduced a no alloc buffer segments, which uh, is uh, a version of buffer segments suitable for no alloc environments. Basically, the reason for this is that, that I wanted to avoid uh, parsing the Captain Proto message every time a field is accessed. So I, I needed a way to uh, store the reader somewhere. And uh, finally, if you have any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. You can find the project on GitHub uh, under Project Machine PuzzleFS, and also you can contact me uh, at uh, amikulas at cisco.com. Yeah, thank you.